Alright guys, we're going to be watching SCP-6011, Flat Earth. Uh, I'm not sure if it's about like whether it's Flat Earth here in North America. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. You guys have to leave a comment down below. And without further ado, let's get into this. Have you ever been walking on the beach and happened upon a tide pool? Suddenly you find an entire world contained in that little pool of water. Little creatures swimming around and going about their lives, completely oblivious to the giant watching them from above. There's also something incredible about that. The way whole worlds can exist inside something so small. In the central Sahara Desert, the SCP Foundation discovered a tiny world of their own like nothing anyone had ever seen before. SCP-6011, also known as the Flat Earth. SCP-6011 is a circular area hanging about 5 centimeters in the air. The radius of the area spans roughly 500 meters and is buried 156 meters below the ground within a deposit of limestone. The SCP exists as a two-dimensional plane, three-dimensional objects passing through as if they were not there at all. All of the materials found within SCP-6011, both organic and inorganic, resemble their three-dimensional counterparts. There are a wide variety of living organisms within SCP-6011, designated SCP-6011-1. The smallest instance of SCP-6011-1 resembles ordinary Earth-based single-celled organisms. The most notable species of SCP-6011-1 is referred to as Plana hominem, the closest thing SCP-6011 has to human beings. Members of Plana hominem resemble the side profile of a human, with a visible head that includes a brain, a nose, and an eye. They also have distinct muscular, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, nervous, endocrine, cardiovascular, urinary, and reproductive systems. The only way for Plana hominem to move is via several cilia-like structures that they can also use to pick up objects. Dr. McAllis was assigned to head the research into SCP-6011 and its various residents. In pursuit of further knowledge of Plana hominem, Dr. McAllis decided decided to select a subject to interview about the nature of SCP-6011. He settled on an educated individual named Iotis and decided to initiate contact. Iotis was playing a game alone in his office when Dr. McAllis played a short, high-pitched noise on a speaker suspended five centimeters above them. Startled by the sound, Iotis reacted, calling out, Pardon? When Dr. McAllis spoke, Iotis was immediately perplexed and frightened, unable to see where his voice was coming from. He moved around the room, feeling the walls, searching for the source of the mysterious voice as Dr. McAllis insisted that they move to the north and stop looking. Iotis threatened to call the police, accusing Dr. McAllis of being a thief who had invaded his home. Dr. McAllis attempted to calm Iotis down, reminding him that his yelling would disturb his son and daughter. This only upset the subject further, and he accused McAllis of being a stalker in addition to a thief. Finally, Dr. McAllis was able to subdue the subject by insisting that he was not a thief or a stalker, but a messenger. He promised no harm would come to Iotis or his family if they would just listen to what he had to say. McAllis identified himself as a doctor, bonding with Iotis over their shared education. Iotis requested that McAllis show himself, and since he was unable to do so, he briefly lowered a mechanical piston into the surface of SCP-6011. Though McAllis was unable to cross into SCP-6011, this allowed him to introduce a physical presence into the area. After their conversation, Iotis agreed to participate in another interview. This particular conversation was cut short when two police officers approached the house after noise complaints from the neighbors. Iotis called out to McAllis as he left, referring to him as Angel. Following this initial contact and the interview that ensued, Dr. McAllis and this team performed several other interviews with Iotis. As more information was collected via observation and conversation, McAllis decided to put together a seminar and a Q&A with junior researchers at the Foundation regarding the details of SCP-6011. During the seminar, Dr. McAllis explained the nature of SCP-6011 and its discovery. It was first happened upon by Italian colonial forces in 1912. At the time, they thought it was an extended form of the cave system. 
but the Foundation knew better. After introducing the junior researchers to SCP-6011, Michaelis provided more information on Iotis himself. He made it clear that Iotis is not to be mocked for assuming Michaelis to be an angel, explaining it this way. Imagine someone suddenly appearing within your house. Imagine someone describing the direct shape of your insides while informing you what your relative across the country is doing. Would you not also cry out, Angel? Angel, where are you, Angel? After this introductory portion, and taking a moment to plug his book, The Life in Plain, which was co-authored by Iotis himself, Michaelis opened the floor to questions. One of the junior researchers asked why the residents of SCP-6011 look so human. Michaelis responded with a question of his own. Do they even look human? Or is it natural for our brain to make connections between vaguely humanoid-shaped objects as we want to feel a sense of familiarity with them? Michaelis confirmed that after a significant amount of testing, SCP-6011 is definitely two-dimensional. Somehow, it has no width. Because of this dimensional difference between SCP-6011 and the ordinary world, nothing should be removed from the boundaries of the flat world. Forcing a two-dimensional object or being into our world would cause it to either rearrange itself to fit into a three-dimensional configuration or cause it to split apart. At best, it would become malformed. At worst, the item would undergo instantaneous nuclear fission. Nothing can be placed inside of SCP-6011 from the outside world either. Three-dimensional objects can pass through temporarily, showing only a cross-section of the object. The Foundation advises against attempting to place any objects inside as it would change the enthalpy of the system. During his observation of SCP-6011, as well as his interviews with Iotis, Dr. McAllis uncovered a wide variety of facts about life inside the Flat Earth. The Plana Hominim live in a feudal society, where people are born into a class position and the role of the parents is passed along to their offspring. The social hierarchy is broken down into estates. The estates are indicated by a color applied under the skin of each person at their birth. There is no opportunity for upward mobility or for fall from grace, only to stay in the position one is born into. Those of the red estate belong to the monarchy of SCP-6011. The orange are the administrators. The yellow are priests, scribes, and record keepers. The green are similar to the middle class of 18th century Europe, encompassing teachers, physicians, lawyers, and other educated professionals. Blue are merchants, tradesmen, and skilled workers, and purple are the manual laborers. Because of the difficulty of accomplishing tasks in only two dimensions, the upper class citizens have at least two servants apiece. All servants come from the estates ranked below green. Because physical writing is difficult in the boundaries of SCP-6011, members of the yellow cast are trained as voice scribes. They memorize and repeat large amounts of information, such as entire books, transcriptions of speeches or laws. Entertainment in SCP-6011 is largely voice-based as well, with visual theaters considered a luxury only for the highest class citizens. The entertainment of the common people is found in the voice theater a place where entertainment is structured around dialogue and the sound of artificially created ambiance. Naturally, the Foundation does not want any civilian stumbling on SCP-6011. Though it poses no threat to humanity, knowledge of its existence could cause chaos and could very well endanger the inhabitants of SCP-6011. Site-044 was set up around SCP-6011 in order to protect it. No construction is permitted within a 10-kilometer radius of the area, under a cover story about the Libyan government blocking off the area for conservation purposes. SCP-6011 is stored in a hermetically sealed chamber, away from external influences. All interactions with SCP-6011 or any of the organisms living within it must be approved by the head researcher of Provisional Site-044. A monitoring system is set up perpendicular to SCP-6011, so that the research team can keep an eye on the activity inside without disturbing the residents. The monitoring system is, unfortunately, not without its flaws. One day, there was a malfunction in the system that caused the breakdown of the camera rails, and several metallic components came loose and plunged into the surface of SCP-6011. There was no damage, but the objects were seen by several civilians. 
The Foundation was concerned that the sight of massive pieces of mysterious objects appearing and disappearing suddenly in a public space would cause mass panic among the people of SCP-6011. However, the research team was shocked to see the two-dimensional people carrying on with their ordinary day-to-day -day lives. They performed an anti-cognito hazard screening in order to determine what was causing this strangely placid response to what should have been a devastating shock to the people. They discovered a large building, hidden by a form of visual cognito hazard, shaped like an octagon. Further monitoring of this unusual building captured a voice recording of a scribe, reciting an account of the monitor equipment disaster. Soon after, Iotis was removed from his home by officers that refused to disclose what organization they were working for. All of this, the building, the arrest, the report of the incident was traced to a secret organization operating inside of SCP-6011 known as the Doctors of the Church. The group was made up of yellow and orange estate members, with a small selection of green, blue, and purple field agents. The research team could not help but notice how similar the Doctors of the Church are to the Foundation itself. Their mission statements are very much the same, upholding the veil of secrecy between the unusual and the population they have sworn to protect, while working to understand the anomalies that they are trying to conceal. All three-dimensional interlopers are scrubbed from the public consciousness or hidden from the people at large. Further research indicated that the incident would have completely destroyed 6011 if the doctors of the church had not worked to deploy reality anchors to keep the baseline reality of the world intact. Dr. McAllis wrote about this group, affectionately nicknamed the Little Foundation, saying, When I look at them, I see, well, us, and a little crumb of limestone falling from the ceiling of the karst or a bug somehow making its way onto the surface of SCP-6011, phasing in and out of existence must have terrified them. And so they found a way to conceal all that was illogical from the general public, as did we. The reality of SCP-6011 raises some fascinating, if a bit troubling, questions. What dimensions are there that we have no knowledge of? Just as the two-dimensional beings cannot conceive of us, what four-dimensional beings, five-dimensional beings, and so on might be out there that we can't begin to wrap our heads around. To a creature with no concept of a third dimension, creatures that exist within our world seem like angels or even gods. Perhaps the things in this world we cannot explain are simply creatures that exist in more dimensions than we are able to conceive of. Truly, there may be no difference between the little foundation and the SCP foundation that we know. Looking down at the residents of SCP-6011 and all that they think they know might encourage us to feel superior. Instead, it should make us curious and perhaps even make us afraid of what we might be unable to understand. Dr. McAllis summarized his thoughts on SCP-6011 in its file. We had prior interactions with entities that claimed to originate from higher geometrical dimensions, yet our mind was never really capable of understanding them. Where we stand, we have the capability to imagine the lives of those in the two-dimensional space. Sadly, the same cannot be said for our understanding of the four-dimensional reality. It is often said that the human brain is like a computer. So just like a computer can never completely emulate a machine more advanced than itself, so do we lack the ability to understand higher dimensions. To a creature outside of our understanding, we are the citizens of the flat earth, shuffling back and forth, unable to see that which lies beyond. Now go check out SCP-999 The Tickle Monster and SCP-978 Design. Goodbye.